I'd like okay. to thank everyone for joining us today. Welcome to today's CNTF webinar titled The Cybernetics of Observability and Monitoring. I'm Carlisa Campos, Senior Member of Technical Staff at VMware and also cloud native, uh, a cloud native ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today, William Louth. He is a complexity scientist at Instana. So before we get started, for real, uh, just a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, you are not able to, you're not able to talk as an attendee, but we do have a Q&A box at the bottom of, his, of the screen. You can access that. Feel free to drop your questions there and actually, we encourage you to use the Q&A as opposed to the chat because it's much easier for us to manage it. And we'll get to your questions at the end of the presentation. We will stop around quarter to 11 uh, Pacific time. And so we are all uh, clear where we are. This is an official webinar of the CNCF. And as such, it's subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code. Basically, please be, be respectful of all your fellow participants, presenters, and hosts. With that, I will hand it over to William to start the presentation. Thank you, William. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, well, good evening in terms of where I am, based in Europe, in Holland, um, and uh, it's probably good morning in, in the US. Um, yeah, as already as said, my, I'm William Lout, I'm a complexity scientist at Instanet. Uh, just a little bit of background on where I'm coming from. Um, uh, for the Last 20 years, I've worked in the areas of observability, controllability, and operability. So observability, I mean, that's a new thing. Uh, I probably would have called it monitoring before, but nowadays we're referring to observability. And there are my areas, at least in, with, with regard to Instana, is I'm looking for new ways of uh, building observability into systems, new models, uh, models that like you would consider today would probably be tracing uh, logging and, and metrics, and I'm looking at new models that will scale to the complexity that we have in modern applications. I've also spent many years building controllability into applications, uh, quality of service brought up into, from the network up into applications and resource management. Uh, I in this talk, I won't be touching on operability, but I also work in operability in, in, Stan in terms of visualizations, how we can help people learn and uh, learn the uh, the models that work within their particular architecture or environment and also how the intelligence of the product uh, manifests uh, between the human and the computer or the machines. Now, so probably to give a, a good perspective on where I come from, uh, it's slightly different than uh, most of the other speakers in this field, uh, which is uh, I mean, we have 20 years of monitoring even before that, but uh, observability is relatively new in terms of the term itself. So I see observability changing in two areas, uh, two directions. We started from logging and, you know, we've had metrics and tracing where we are currently now. And uh, I see that going in two directions where one is more of a high level, more operational effectiveness and DevOps and, and, and human or humane. And there I see we're going in the area of signaling. This is something I will uh, touch on in, in the rest of the talk. The other area is, so signaling is very high level. So it's looking for a model that helps with effectiveness and it's operational. And then the other area is where if you look at logging, we've gone to tracing. Metering is another thing. Tracing today is only about clock time, but metering is about any type of resource. So that's probably the big difference between tracing and metering is that you can have multiple measures between any uh, span or any type of event that you're measuring. Uh, mirroring is where I imagine it's going and it's what I've built in my past job in Autoletics or J-Inspired, which is where you basically mirror the machine's behavior over into another machine. And then I think the future will be around simulation and and there with all of this, what we're doing is 
it's very detailed. So the other one is, is for the DevOps group. And the, uh, the other area is really trying to give people more diagnostics capabilities. And it's really about reconstruction, explorative of the uh, reconstruction itself. It's focused on the developer and it's really at the machine level. And I imagine in the future, it will really be consumed mainly by machines because I don't think that humans can work at that level anymore. Not with this type of systems that we're building. Okay, so um, to bring in cybernetics, I want to talk about why we need to look at a cybernetic view of observability and monitoring. And that's uh, the problem there is the challenges we're talking about is complexity. So what's complex? Well, <laughs> I mean, we have complicated and we have complex, but the, what I consider is we look at complex systems. And concept, com complex systems are really dense networks. So this is a lot of interconnection and interactions in those interconnections. Uh, it consists of adaptive agents. Now, the agent part, some people trolls people because we've had agent technology before, but really the C agent, you could probably say it's a microservice or a library. And, and we'll come to, you know, cloud is an example of adaptive agent where you uh, purchase, a, you know, purchase a service and the service is able to uh, scale up and down the, depending on the workload. So, and in doing that, it's adaptive. So there is adaptive nature already in our systems today. Uh, we are working at complex systems work on multiple scales. And that means that generally it's feedback loops between things and uh, on our boundaries, and but also at time scales and space scales. And that sometimes feedback loop of one is feeding, is signaling toward our uh, higher level feedback systems. So it's not easy to, to drop down layers and still understand each layer uh, without looking at the other layers above. And dynamic states is determining um, what is the current state of a system, a current state of a particular subset of the system or the state of an entity. And that because the environment is changing, because it's quite vast, um, and that's, it's a very dynamic uh, um, system. And that means that the states that themselves are dynamic. And okay, so what we started with, when well, you think of topology, so when you think about interconnections, you could think more at a hardware level and you can talk about hosts or even OS partitioning and you have hosts that we've seen containers come along. And then we've seen clusters and then we have services which have load balances and multiple instances. And you can see in all of this, we're, we're multiplying components. You know, the, the number of components is, uh, is increasing. Um, and what we've had is we've had the monoliths where they had some kind of libraries that, you know, components were embedded within them. And then we have microservices rippling into increasing the uh, modularity of the system. And then, you know, the natural progression is probably to flows and functions where it's just a pattern of, uh, of self-organizing systems. Or you could say it's developer organizing, but uh, there's some organization within there. Now, the connectivity, which is important to the, uh, um, to the complexity itself, the important aspect of it. And we can see that in, in Sana, like this is actually a screenshot of one of the customers of Instana that has, has, I haven't put the whole number of nodes in there because it over clustered it. But behind that, that line is not some art form I did, it's actually taken from one of our customers. And there, you know, as you can see, the number of nodes, you know, the APIs are large, the number of dependencies between those and the, the size of the flows, flows are which could be, you could consider that as a workflow, you could consider that as an endpoint within the service. And, and you can see that it's, uh, it's getting out of hand. It looks complex, or you could say it looks complicated. So, uh, I said cloud is an example of complexity. We have the self-service, the large network access, which is what we require in a complex system. Pooling and elasticity, this is the dynamic nature of the environment and metered services, which brings in a kind of control mechanism there where you can have rate limiting and, uh, and service quality uh, settings. And this of course means that the, um, uh, the environment is changing uh, on a, a moment by moment basis. Now, another thing with what we're seeing with complexity, of course, is change. You know, we've had uh, previously we had six every 
deployment cycles for applications or service uh, were like six to a year. Months people would plan, they would do a lot of testing and then they would release it. The bugs would mount up over time and then there would be another large release and then someone would hopefully push those bugs and introduce less, uh, less number of bugs. And, and that cycle was quite big. Now, the, the, the height here represents um, the number of issues that can come in and how long they stay there. Because the, you know, the, if you have an issue in production and the longer it stays, then you know, of course, then the greater the damage it is to the system. And so what we've had is the shorter, we've had shorter deployment cycles. You know, we're, we're now dropping from six months to weekly or to daily. And that also means that um, we're squashing those issues. We're improving, the, optimizing the system. It's a continuous uh, process, of, you know, a process of improvement. And it also means that the any negativeness that we have introduced, you know, and regressions or so, uh, is minimized. The impact is minimized in terms of the time itself. Of course, I'm not, we're not sure of the of the nature of the impact itself, but the duration of it is minimized by constantly changing our environment. And the future looks like it will just keep getting even more fine grain where we're having uh, deployments and uh, nearly automatic, not even um, controlled by an operator like pressing saying, okay, I'm gonna release now in the next 15 minutes or so. The problem with that, of course, is that the rate of change and the growth of complexity can put a stress, uh, a stress on a company, on an infrastructure. And there, there are two likely outcomes. You either have adaptive control. Well, I wouldn't say just adaptive is a useful way because you're always adapting to what, you, uh, what you're sensing within the environment and how, at what speed you can go with change and complexity. And, and what you really want to do is to regulate the amount of change and the amount of complexity that you're, you're bringing on into your system. Um, and if you don't able to do that, so that's a kind of a steering mechanism for the company. Uh, and the company also has to change in line with the rate of change that is happening within its environment and, and also uh, within its own infrastructure. And, and, and if you're not able, if an application or a service is not able to keep up with our, our company, then the, the natural thing is for it to collapse under the stress of that. Um, and the way to see this is kind of like, I don't know, this sometimes it's a hit and miss, this analogy. But if you remember in Terminator 2 at the end, the, we had the T-1000, or I think it was the one that was liquefied, liquefied. You could see that trying to constantly changing shape and it couldn't stabilize. And that's what happens really in these kind of environments where the rate of change and the complexity keeps getting out of hand, that the company doesn't know what, or the or infrastructure is not able to uh, stabilize. And stability is really a sense of memory. So the less, and this is a challenge in oper uh, operations and observability, is the environment constantly changing? How do you uh, create a model or how do you reason about something that that reasoning can only have 15 minutes of validity? You know, uh, that's the problem. So now I'm going to move on to cybernetics. Uh, so that's the problem statement and cybernetics is kind of like a solution or at least a solution to how we can use observability and monitoring to help us with the complexity and with change. So cybernetics, the standard definition is it's a study of control and communication. Uh, in the original book, uh, it was about animals and the machines, uh, humans you could say there. And really, yeah, the, the two key things there are control and communication. And it's very like what we see in the DevOps environment. Now, okay, what does control and communication? Typically, when we think of communication in cybernetics, we think of signaling. And the control is some type of action or response to that. Uh, and you can see a little bit in application systems we have now today, we've had the reactive uh, uh, manifest or reactive um, uh, systems and reactive platforms, which is a response to to how to handle workload and how to handle uh, vari uh, vari variability in a system. So, classic example of cybernetics comes down to always the feedback system, the feedback loop, and and, and I'm taking this really from the manufacturing, and then I'll try to relate it a little bit more to something else. So there you have, in a manufacturing system, you have an assembly line, you have some kind of input coming in to a controller. And the controller has both the input, which is some kind of supply system, and then there's goals given to the controller to regulate that flow. 
the flow passes along into some kind of, you know, we have uh, activities are being performed uh, in the process that outputs, uh, we output how, when it comes out of, the, uh, uh, out of the process, we have an output that is measured by a sensor and that feedback, you know, that's the, those measurements are fed back into the controller. And this is where it can see as like, it can regulate the amount of flow that's going through the system. So if you can think, can think of it like a valve, if you open up the valve and then you can have a measurement at the other end of where it outputs, you can see as you're opening, uh, does it increase the output, in, is it linear to the, out, uh, to the input? Or is there some degrada degradation when you start to exceed a certain uh, rate of uh, flow within the, in the system? And that could see that you're slowing down and then you have to take a corrective action. And that's typically what you're looking at is a feedback system. That's cybernetics. Another way of looking at it is coming from the systems thinking or system dynamics where you have an inflow. It's more abstract here. It's more, there's an inflow coming in and there's a stock system, which is kind of like a resource that you're managing. So an inflow will add to a stock. And then as you go outflow, you take from the stock. And how you regulate this system is the amount of uh, stock that's in there. And uh, from a programming background, you could probably see that as a more like a semaphore, a pool and all the number of tokens or tickets that you can take. And you regulate then your system by looking at how, the, uh, how much you give into the stock uh, and how that changes the inflow and the outflow at the rate of those. A little bit more abstract there, but getting more concrete uh if you were to manage maybe like uh, if you're thinking like quality of service where you had something that had to begin a task you would have a resource pool which you could see that as worker threads or something like that and when you begin an action so in the, if you look in the middle of this chart here you have a begin and that takes a res reserve something from the pool of course you take it from the pool itself and that's the minus sign there and if it's not there, it doesn't generally do some kind of blocking. And then after you've reserved that, that means like you've got your token, think of a, a, hotel, a restaurant, you reserve a table, you get your reservation and off you go do your work. So, and then you put that into your reserve pool. And this could be like I've reserved two seats. And then later, maybe I have to ring up and someone says, oh, uh, well, maybe I make a change and I need another additional two seats. Well, I'd need to remember what I already have and then I ask for another two. And then, so you have this reserve pool which is what you've taken from the resource pool. And then when, of course, when I go and have my dinner uh, with colleagues, you, and then you're completed, you release that, and that goes back into the control system. And that really allows other people to come to the table. So uh, control there is, you know, how much capacity you put into the, into the resource pool, and then at the duration of how long someone is in a reserve state, and then to they get to the, re to the release. So this is where, you know, you can find, there's a, I can um, share some links uh, uh, in, uh, in the Instana website later on, on this, for the information on this. So cybernetics really comes down to feedback, flow systems, uh, control about it, controlling the feedback and the flow, and then the communication, which is the sensory uh, feedback there, the signals that are going through the system. If you think of DevOps, DevOps is very similar. It's about feedback on the changes that you're making and how, uh, how good those changes are in production. Uh, the workflow itself, how much flowing are, how much the rate of change that you allow going into the system. And this is where you put in some control. Some people call them error budgets. Other people look at the risk levels that are associated with it and more formal. And then of course you're communicating, you're communicating between human to, to human or animal to animal. And then there's communication between man and machine. And even within the process, you know, people want like to know that there's a, the system needs has done a change and that change can be replicated to other systems, sometimes through a Slack, through an integration, or even to in standard where we have a pipeline feedback mechanism that allows us to tag a window in the timeline to saying that there was a change here. And that's useful because you're always communicating with other agents in your environment and those agents can be human or a machine machine here being the slack. So cybernetics then, if you see then what we're seeing where uh, Kubernetes or Kubernetes is that we have operators there that are very dynamic and changing uh, the topology, changing how the system is structured. And you see also humans are doing a human operator. 
And what's going to, the challenge in the future will be and how you can bring those two together to able to share, you know, responsibilities, uh, coordinate and collaborate on it, and even hand over tasks from one to another uh, in that. And I hope that, I believe that cybernetics is probably a way that we need to do that. And we have to look at models of how, uh, um, how we can model the system of feedback uh, loops and, and signaling and, uh, and resource management and how we can get the, both the human, uh, the DevOps person and the operator, the software to understand the, the system, both in terms of resources, in terms of resource modeling and the policies that we have with that. Now, of course, this all sounds like you're looking for something, you know, when you think about this, we're, what we're really trying to do in all DevOps is always have some intelligence. It's intelligence, um, yeah, and what does that mean? Intelligence is action appropriate to the context. So, well, there's other forms of intelligence in terms of reasoning, but when we think of DevOps, which is a very action oriented, is that we're looking to make an appropriate action to the context we're in. And, and this is the, then the next problem is, what is that context? Because context is the environment, the, the system, but this is something that is changing. And this is where observability comes into it. So context, context, context is the circumstances that form the setting for an event. Sorry, the light going off here. Um, so what we're really talking about there is, uh, the setting we would naturally think of in terms of an environment and events that are you know, happening within the environment and they also construct the environment, they have an impact on the environment itself. So when I start with the Instan, it was formed in 2014, at least the inception part, which is where I came in and, uh, and then I, I left shortly after that for other reasons. Uh, and we, I was asked by the Instana group to come up, uh, the, the team itself, the inception team, to come up with how I imagined the future of uh, uh, observability and monitoring was going to look like. And I always believe that the tooling that we're trying to create is really trying to create a story and narrative. And so I looked to the film industry, you know, look for fil to film uh, to expl help explain like, what we should be doing. Uh, uh, what we should be trying to construct or what is the context where we're trying to reconstruct or simulate. And in film, of course, you have these kind of things here. We have, you have a setting, a scene, an act, and there's a sequence there. And then you have a, something, you know, there's actors within the scene and they make a, you know, they have some uh, behavioral changes there. And of course, changes within the environment happen. So, and these are all happening at, with lower level of events. And so this is what I mean by context. Context is really the reconstruction of an event within that environment, at least to enough that it can make sense to us uh, of where, what the system looked like at that time in terms of the nodes, the topology, what flows were happening, and what it was the health of the system itself. So that's what we're trying to do always with observability is reconstruction. And so but the definition of observability, which is, uh, has changed you know, uh, in the last few years, the, the original definition was the inference of internal states of a system from the knowledge of its external outputs. So the state there where we're talking about would probably be more a health state, the quality of what it was doing, was it operating? Because observability was really around a measure, a measure of can you understand the state of the system? And states tend to be conditions and it's a very limited number of uh, conditions, at least when we think about modeling, because if we were to think about that a, a system had a million states, it wouldn't really be a very useful model. So generally what we always do, we try to group them into categories of states where they uh, represent, this is a good state, uh, you know, a healthy and okay state, degraded state, defective state. So we take these kind of uh, higher levels of uh, categorization of a state. And that's what observability should be trying to do. So observability is, in, and how we do that is, of course, coming back from uh, cybernetics is, you're always looking for signals within your environment. So an observer is observing other systems. Uh, and this doesn't mean that the observer is outside the system. It could be one microservice looking at another service or agent looking at another agent, but they're observing each other's behavior. And those uncertain behaviors are signals. And from those signals, we infer state. Now, the best way to see this, if you think about animals, because, you know, animals also have signaling. 
And animals like will make aggressive moves, like they will uh, move their hands up and shout and growl. And generally that signal is a signal of, you know, uh, aggression. And, and, and if that happens frequently enough, or at least consecutively, we're probably in fear a state of that this animal is wild or, or, you know, or crazy or angry. And this is the state we infer from it. So an observer is looking for that. And that's the way we should be considering observability of systems. So observability today, in terms of when we look at a legacy model, we think about traces. Uh, this is distributed tracing or even local tracing. We think of metrics, which is your little dots on your chart over a timeline, and log, which is echo chamber for our developers writing strings to themselves. And in the past, we've had that where we put them into tables, they go into the database of some single data store or tables to map each of the types. And then we had a console where we query the data set and chart it. And that's what we really had up to uh, a few years ago. The modern way is really to think about sensors and we're really moving into multi-sensor environment. We have sensors who are making collections. These are generally being passed on to agents because we can't always get to the backend systems that we have. And sometimes we're, we're writing to multiple backend systems. So just generally agents are placed in there and they're really channels for pushing those collections off into another system. And there this, this other system is generally acting like a fusion. It's taking all the sensory data and fusing it into to make sense of it. So it's taking metrics, it's taking traces, it's taking logs, it's taking the topology discovered or configuration, and it reconstructs a model, which is the fusion, uh, like a, a topology of system. And the topology structurally could be, you know, the nodes, the hosts are all living in, and the topology could also be the call graph. And there, and what it's focused on, of course, then once it's got a model, it's focused on change. But change is not really what we want. We know change is always happening. So that really is not a very useful thing to be constantly monitoring. I mean, you can monitor the rate of change, but it's not going to tell you much unless you have a means of classifying those changes. And then you, you look for signals for those and then to derive a status. Because at the end of the day, what we're always trying to do is what determine the status or the state of uh, one or more of our, our systems. And that could break down into subsystems. Just checking my time. Okay, so that's what we've had. Um, and I think what we're also seeing in the observability spaces, we're moving from, and this is where recollection was probably more of the legacy view, if we go back to the legacy where we had these tables. And what we did there is we had searching capabilities. So we searched, we did a recollection is what happened at this point in time. And so generally you look for a tag you, or look for a time a window and you search for it and, and then you identify something. But the problem there is what should you be searching for? And this is, this might have not been so much of a problem before when you were working with a monolith that change, didn't change until, uh, you know, or didn't change unless every six months or so, so you could build up some knowledge. But when everything is, uh, is changing uh, uh, rapidly, uh, and there's very little memory in there, what you really want to do is the system to focus on recognition, recognition of similarities or, you know, and recognition that something is even different. And then signify, uh, you know, of course, once you can recognize something, then you can give significance to it and that can be, you know, it's significant or insignificant. And then what we want there is, is suggestiveness. We want the, the tooling or the monitoring solutions to be more suggestive on what we should look at rather than us searching or exploring. We just simply, I don't think operations today have, have simply the bandwidth to go around exploring. And uh, it probably would have been a useful tool previously when we didn't have such uh, systems that we have today, but with the change, with the growth in the complexity, with the number of entities, I, I don't think that's scalable anymore. So maturity, we have to move to more recognition and suggestive uh, solutions like inspections or advice to us for a human to scale as opposed to a, a machine. So why do we observe? So we come down to, we think about observability. Why do we observe? Well, in the more the generalist term is to monitor signals. And we, we always hear, I'll come back to what signals are later, but of course everybody's is, is taking measurements and hoping from in there, you know, that we know the measurements have a lot of noise and then we're looking for a signal, but no one really knows what a signal is. But generally that's what we're looking for. We're looking to monitor signals in, uh, in the environment. So this is why we observe. 
why do we monitor, of course, is why would we just keep watching for signals? Because we want to control states. Our infrastructure is something that we're responsible for. So, and the way we can um, manage that is by looking at the states of the system. So we're, when we look to control states, we're really trying to manage the service quality, to manage the service that we're delivering. So we have to look towards control to help us to manage. Observability gives us that context. It, it reconstructs something for us, but at the end of the day, we, we still need to reason about it and act on it uh, to manage our system. So observability, <clears throat> observability is basically a subordinate or servant to controllability. And controllability is really where we're all going. And controllability can manifest in that there's a machine taking over control and self-regulating itself or controllability could be just humans responding to what they see within their observability or monitoring space. So controllability is, is being able to uh, direct or influence the behavior or the course of events in our systems. And how it fits in with observability is controllability needs observability for perception to reconstruct, to create the context and then controllability needs to have some kind of monitoring capability that tells it what it should attend to. And then when there is something of significance, what actions should it respond to? So that's where controllability comes into it. Now, I'm going to touch a little bit because when we come to cybernetics, you know, cybernetics is really about control, but it's about control of other systems. And you can also have second order uh, cybernetics, which is control of the controller. So when you, when you think about controllability, you can also apply it to monitoring because you have to observe. observe. Observation is an action and observation, if it's an action that needs can be regulated, then you have basically some kind of controlled feedback loop. So monitoring, which some people would like to imagine monitoring is the old traditional way you, where you pin your server and you say, are you up or down? Uh, and I think there was use, there was a use, a usefulness to that because it would focus really on the state of the system, but it really didn't give us an accurate assessment of it, and that was unfortunate. But I think monitoring still is here today. It just me. I think we are associated when we think about monitoring. We always associate with a, a technology or a tooling, and it's really a process. Monitoring is the process that manages our how we observe our environment. So. And that's what I want to talk about is because there's always a bit of this observability versus monitoring and you know observability is even greater than monitoring or bigger than monitoring. I think observability probably looks at more data than monitoring but monitoring is really about steering observability because there's only so much we can collect. And we've had this with profiling agents where profiling agents are, have a depth of mechanism, they look at their own overhead and they adapt. And that to me is a monitoring capability where it's determining you know, is this event useful or not? And that's really what humans want. Uh, uh, our operations should be focusing on is I want a tool that helps me um, manage the degree of observer observability within my environment because I simply can't store everything. I, it also in the, it increases overhead in storage costs, increases overhead in cognitive uh, uh, workload for both the machine as well as a human. And that, you know, you want it to direct attention and you want to integrate multiple senses and, 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 and that observability today tends to be like sliced down or silo like here's tracing, here's logging, here's, here's something else and here's uh, like events or so. And so you, monitoring is really that fusion, it's integrating the senses and it's reconstructing mem memories because observability is really a collection system. Uh, it, it might allow you to explore, it might allow you to search, but it's not about reconstructing a memory because we know memories are uh, multifaceted and that means we have to integrate multiple sensors and we have to give it significance and relate it to what is of interest to us, which is how we uh, make representations. So monitoring is about identifying patterns that observability is not is focused on. Observability is about collecting them and assigning significance to them, aiding uh, the reasoning of the human and the machine and guiding our action in there. And of course, we want feedback on the actions that we take to help, to help regulate the observability and also the, what we've done in terms of control itself. 
So action can also manifest in action towards observability or action to the context of the environment that we're, we're doing here. So what I like to see then is there, but how I paint monitoring and management versus observability and controllability. So observability is seen and the controllability is that and reacting and action on it is that there are two, there's a str strategic track or lane and then there's a tactical and the uh, tactical is uh, you know the day-to-day -day operational observability and controllability you know the operations what control do they have in their environment and the observability feeds data into the monitoring the monitoring feeds back data signaling or you know regulations policy back into observability and controllability is also feeding into monitoring and monitoring is also uh, helping to regulate also the controllability there and it's the same with controllability is feeding into management. Management is really, is, is management's view is how much change do we want to take in our environment? How can we do that change, which is, comes down to controllability? How can we monitor that change or uh, the success of that? And then how do we see that change is happening? And that's probably the way to see is switching, zigzagging from the strategic and tactical. And there's a maturity track in that. So maturity is really going from observability to monitoring, as in at least the, my definition of mon monitoring, which is the modern version, and not in terms of product specific like pinging. And, uh, and there's a, the maturity is from the top to the bottom, observability to monitoring, to increase controllability in the system. Uh, both the machine and, and uh, man and, and, and scaling that. And then of course to management, which is always about the policies of that change. So how do I go, ooh. So observability is looking, monitoring is seen, controllability is acting and management is regulating. That's the way I like to see it. So um, just another way of seeing observability and monitoring is observability is given a sensory data. And monitoring is the semantics that we attach to the sensory data and the significance we derive from that. So you can see that the sensory data as it moves up from the bottom to the top uh, left hand corner is really getting smaller. And that's where we increase significance because we're really looking to all to get greater significance by crunching down that data and turning it into information. So 12, now some people call it data, but the semantics are there. Okay. Effective monitoring then depends on uh, connecting, on contextualizing. And when I mean connecting, I really mean rebuilding, reconnecting uh, association of we have made a change, that change is rippling into the environment. We then connect that back to the control that we want to have on that. And then the context is building, rebuilding our environment of what it looks like. So an observability tool is always rebuilding context. It's building a memory in a moment in time where it says this is what the system looked like this is what the topology looked like in terms of hardware uh, containerization you know uh, containerization i mean in a very general sense is one thing is contained within another which is the isolation and then the the, the flows that cross over those boundaries and so what we want to do is keep speeding up that change, connecting that change back to the control of the, the, the change that does happen, or the, uh, the effects within the environment, and then relating that rebuilding a context, uh, a new context that represents that new state. So we're in the home straight now. Uh, this is where we get onto uh, cognition. And I'm, I'm looking, sorry, I'm just looking at my time. So I think I got nine minutes to get this, so it's probably okay. And then I'll take uh, questions for the last 10 minutes. So cognition is the kind of, uh, it's, I've changed the color here to purple because I see this is where we're heading. This is the future. And this is really what we're all looking for. And like when you buy a product that says AI ops uh, or something that says intelligent this, and you know, you're really looking for something that is cognition within what we're collecting and what we're monitoring. So what is cognition? Um, and that's the process of acquiring knowledge, understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. So experience could be you know, the uh, uh, reconstruction of uh, episodic memory, or even the memory itself, living it. And, and of course, we have to do, to create an experience, we need a sense. We need a sense of the environment we're in. And then we have to think through that. We, have, we create representations from the experience and from the senses. And it's not sequential, of course, because thought itself impacts uh, experience and a sense it's, 
there because there is regulation there. So you, the more attentive you are to something, the more you see, the more the thought you can consider on that to give the thought that you give to it, and then, then the experience heightens. So it's uh, the circular processes between those systems. Now, my interest is that what I, what I, I see how we're going with microservices and to other types of systems uh, of uh, uh, modularity and uh, flow uh, is that it's a social network. We're seeing nodes come up there and we're, we're seeing microservices not be just more of a call. I make a call to something else and it returns a response. What we're seeing today with microservices and other types of messaging system is that there's a lot of metadata being uh, transmitted. That the interaction that we're seeing with services is not send and give me the data back. There's more like, oh, I'm going to drop the data because I'm overloaded at the moment. Oh, uh, um, there's some rate limiting, so I'm going to have to slow you down for a bit. There are some handshaking going on. So we've gone from RPC, which is you know the remote procedure calls, to what I cons consider conversations, conversations between services. And, and you see this with the reactive manifest where they're trying to signal when they're available to or when they want something else to be re created and, and consumed by them. There's a mechanism going on beyond the call itself. So there's like two channels. There's the data channel, which is here's the request, here's the, here's the response, but then there's the control channel within that, which is you know whether I'll accept it now, or whether I'm taking it, but I've actually dropped it into a queue and I will give you a call back later. And if you see that, it's a very, it's very human-like. So, so I consider then, you know, where we're heading is kind of a like social cognition, which is the study of how people process, store, and apply information about other people. And I think that's probably the way to see um, the future of observability and monitoring, and especially in the microservices or any type of service where it could be down to even uh, a lambda or a task or an event handler is is we're looking to how services process, store, and apply information about other services and system contexts. So it's not so much now about the workflow that we're looking at, but also we're looking at other services. So if you think uh, more concrete, maybe it's a bit too high in the sky with that one. If you think about um, uh, you have a circuit breaker, a circuit breaker is kind of cognition, is that if when something breaks or if you try to access the database, and a few times and it fails, then you put it into, you kind of, you, you say, okay, I'm not going to go near that database until it starts to act beta, uh, uh, you, I'm going to refuse the next few requests that come in and say that uh, the service is not available and wait and not overload the other database and then tell them to call back later or refuse the connection there and then before, before talking to the database. And what you see then is a kind of a sense that, like what we would have in a workplace where if a, work, if a manager was walking over to someone's desk and be, before we had these old paper cabinets and people would, or the um, trays, where people would put the work in the tray, if you came over to a person and you seen their work in the tray was, was quite high, you wouldn't drop the new work in there. You would probably look for another service to do that. And that's really what we're doing. We're, we're seeing services take on this new uh, semantics. And it's actually quite challenging for observability tools because we can't now distinguish between, uh, so let's say you uh, service talks to another service and the first few times it times out or fails and then it, re it does have a retry policy and then it succeeds. Now, that service where this, the caller service will report back to its client that it succeeded and, and we wouldn't be aware to it it succeeded in what it needed to do because it eventually got there. And even though the other service failed, in terms of the conversation with the calling service, it succeeded eventually. And so how do we do that observability? Because how does a trace, or to a tool focus on trace, know when, well, okay, we are, we're, we're, we're allowing failure, but so I can ignore these traces because the final trace succeeded. So we, we can't seem to capture that today with distributed tracing, so we have to do something different. So I see what we're doing with service cognition is how services process and store information about other services is, is looking at how services interact with each other in a more dynamic and adaptable way in sensing the other service. So if you sense that the time of the other service is slowing down the response time, you might change your own behavior in terms of how quickly you call it. 
Now, the way they would do that, of course, is signaling. And there is kind of a signaling already there today. It's like HTTP uh, codes have that where they can say, I've dropped you or I'm overloaded. So we do have signals already embedded um, in systems. There, we just need to formalize and create a universal uh, signaling uh, uh, glossary uh, that works across whatever protocol it has. So signals are involved to convey meaning and influence to receivers. So the signal in itself is to tell something information. And of course, when someone receives a signal, they are meant to change the behavior. And that's why people send an error code back or a HTTP code back because they say redirect this or uh, I'm dropping this or I'm delaying you or uh, this is to try to change the behavior of the caller. So senders obtain effects and receivers obtain, yeah, thank you, uh, obtain two minutes to go, receivers, receivers obtain information. So the cycle, very similar to the feedback systems where a signal is emitted, is transmitted over some kind of medium, there's a receipt of it by a receiver, the receiver records it, he reasons about it and responds. It already, already feels like cybernetics and feedback feels like what we do with observability. So a signal is very different than a message or from a log in that the signal, just the signal itself has a meaning. There is no difference between it. You don't have to unpack the message and look inside of it, and this is where uh, logging fails, is that we, logging is not a signal, it's a message, and inside of that we hope to derive uh, a message. But really what we should be looking at in, in the future is more focus on just sending the signal, the meaning directly. And of course, how do we do that in the environment is, well, we, we can look for a solution like Sigma G, which is a mechanism of coordination out through an environment between agents and actions. And typically you have an agent, or a microservice, it creates actions. These leave signals or signs within the environment on a medium. And the kind of classic example is ants going around when they find foods, they put a pheromone uh, down on the surface of a, you know, or like a grid and then a patch and then another ant picks it up and, and follows along. So this is where basically the history of previous actions affect or stimulate or dampen the effects of uh, future actions. So the effect stimulates, and it could be both negative or, or, um, or positive, the inaction and produces more effects within the environment. And that's what we probably need with Signal. And what I'm working at in Stanit is on Signify. And um, whereas where I try to create a universal uh, signaling language and mechanism for inference of state around services resources and context. This context is the environments we're existing in, the resources or schedules like Kubernetes and, and services, which is the systems microservices that we have. And this is the final slide. And I'm just up there. Uh, so just to recap, when we look at what I think we're, we're, we're moving to is it's not going to scale with metrics, traces and logs. We have millions of metrics. We have even more of traces and logs and people just don't know how to give significance to them and classify them. And it's never gonna happen on the back end. So if the metric is not already, has a signal and, and it has significance at its name, uh, it's more than likely not going to be useful to management. So what we need to do is bring in a newer form of uh, observability technology around signals that can translate into states that we all agree, like status page, you know, where you have these various the states. And, that's, and that is how we dr drill down into metrics and traces. We look for states. When states change to something that's interesting, we look at the signals that generated that. From the signals, we, we determine the time windows, which are useful for looking at metrics, traces, and logs. So I'm finished a little bit over one, one minute. That was great. Thank you, <laughs> William. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised I got through it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And now we have some time for Q&A. Again, uh, please drop your questions on the Q&A box. It's at the very bottom there on the, of the screen. And I have a question here for you from Christian Heidenreich. I apologize if that was mispronounced. The question is, in the beginning, you talked about metering being an evolution of tracing. Can you tell us more about what oh, that means? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so when I worked uh, my previous company, uh, which is Autoletics or J-Inspired, I focus on creating a matrix for the machine, a matrix world. 
And what I did there was, and how I'll distinguish that between tracing, is that Sims, which is what the name is, like Sims as in the game, but it has an a Z in it, is Sims uh, try to reconstruct um, behavior, reconstructed how code executes. So if you think at the fundamental level of what code is in terms of what, you know, how it runs in most systems, is there's threads running, they execute, or sometimes now today, go routines, they, they execute uh, calls which are stack pop, pops and you know, pushing and popping out stack frames. And then of course, this is how we create scope of execution. So what I did with Sims was I said, well, fundamentally, this is what all machines do. They're just popping, uh, pushing and popping uh, frames. Now, ignoring the code that happens within it, you know, most, you know there are some uh, calculations. Everything else is about methods being calling another method. So what I did there is um, I instrumented the JVM and every method call was uh, creating an event. And that event was streamed over into another environment where the event replayed all of the event stream. So if you think about event sourcing, but what's different about it is, is that it wasn't executing the code, it was mirroring the code, it was mimicking it. And it would recreate the threads and it would actually create a pop, push and pop the stack frames like they were there. And it would even delay them to the duration that they were in the environment. Of course, you could also speed it up if you wanted, but it mimicked behavior. And the, probably the best way to see that is like if you think about a, a mime artist on a street where he's, he's cleaning the windows, we know he's not cleaning a window, when he, but we know from his movement that he's uh, mimicking the cleaning of a window. So what I did here, mirroring is basically mimicking that. Is, so mirroring then in terms of tracing, how it differs, tracing today is not really being designed to allow the reconstruction or the replay of a machine like it had happened in the real world. So Sims said, let's create those events, stream them in, and have enough information in it that we can actually reconstruct the flow of it. And to another product or another monitoring tool, it would look like I am the actual application and I'm doing everything, even though you wouldn't be changing the bank account twice. And that's what mirroring is. It's the uh, reconstruction of, of uh, I hope that's explained. it. Okay. It would be like, a, 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 one way to do it, I, actually, I think the best analogy, and I should have said this was, you dream. So today we do an action, we, we have, the, we use the same me mechanism or same uh, system in play when we're looking at something and we're doing something in the real world. But when we dream, we, we our, our dreams are very uh, vivid. We experience it, but we don't have action. We don't go, our, our control system is turned off. And that's what Sims was trying to do. It says, I will replay your memories, but you will not be, you will not be a danger to yourself. You won't be sleepwalking. <laughs> I'm going to ask you the next question. Uh, we have five more minutes only, but before you answer this question, William, would you tell us very quickly how people can reach you for other questions that we have in the queue? We're not going to be able to answer all of them if there is a way yeah, well, they can always LinkedIn or my email address is william.loud at instana.com. So william.loud at instana.com, or if they can just have a chat. Oh, I also have a, a Twitter account, Autoletics, A-U-T-O-L-E-T-I-C-S. So there's also, if you, there's also a Twitter account, Autoletics. And Autoletics is actually a name for flow. It's, it's from a book. The book there is flow and, and Autoletics is type of people who like to experience flow. And that's, that's what I try to do. <laughs> Tons of learning on this webinar. We have four more minutes left. This next question on the Q&A box from Luis Sanchez. Could you comment where Instana is in terms of the levels of your last slide, in parentheses, the pyramid from traces logs to states? Yeah, well, Instana is definitely covering all the boxes in terms of um, uh, the logging, the, the basic of observability. And the reason I've rejoined in Instana and uh, came back in is to bring in the Signify technology. There will be an announcement coming out shortly in that. Uh, but Instana has pretty much covered the whole observability space, but 
of course, with the growing complexity is, and, and uh, we have to come up with new management models and this is the feedback system. So, and Stan is branching out into other areas and looking at how do we see feedback? How do we better support uh, DevOps and not just pro, uh, uh, diagnostics? It's great, it's, a, it's got great diagnostic capability and it's also able to discover and uh, automatically uh, and dynamically uh, the context, you know, reconstruct your topology, reconstruct those call graphs. And that's wonderful. So that's basically a great foundation for me. It's not just taking traces, it's also got the environment context, but what it would miss today, even though it has it to some degree with incidents in the product, is this more state management is significance. And I, I probably it's still early days for people to see why we need a new uh, observability, something like signals, because they're still trying to get, they're still moving to microservices. They're still bringing that over. So they haven't got to the scale out yet. And they're still, you know, working with observability tools. And there will, there will be a moment where they're, they're going to feel that these things are not working for them. And, and I recently did a talk where someone said that, yeah, they, the manager in their company had said, and this is more of a business process level, he said, I don't want anybody producing a metric that I cannot associate an action with. And I think we haven't came to that realization in the, in the space of observability and monitoring. We're in this kind of big data Hadoop phase where everybody is just give me more data and is, is grabbing. It thinks if I keep collecting more, that's going to be useful. But uh, we're going to get, as, as these systems evolve and, and there's greater adoption of microservice platform, we're going to see these kind of problems come up and there's going to be a need for uh, a language that can help man and machine. And I hope Signify will be that. And that's what I'm working on. All right, thank you so much for the answers, William. This is all the time we have today. Thank you so much everyone for participating and we look forward to having you in our next CNCF webinar. The recording of this uh, webinar will be out later today. Thanks okay. again. Thanks everybody for coming. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>